Have any of you ever seen the movie or even the musical School of Rock? 2003 featuring Jack Black. Oh, man. Let me tell you, that, that movie is one of my guiltiest of pleasures. We, I brought a picture of it, frame of reference, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about. I love this movie, and not just because the main character looks and acts exactly like our worship coordinator, Aaron Coventry. No, it has one of the silliest premises of all time, but it has a killer soundtrack, and it is just shockingly heartwarming. So in the film, you have Jack Black, who plays Dewey Finn, a washed-up musician, a man-child who can hardly care for himself, who realizing a way that he can make a quick buck, decides to pose as his roommate in order to be a long-term substitute teacher at a private school. Hilarity ensues as the last person who should ever be teaching is surrounded by 30 children 30 years younger than him who also happen to have a greater emotional maturity than him. Children who Dewey decides are talented enough to be his new band where he spends the entirety of their class time together equipping these students to go into a competition, a local battle of the bands, to, again, try to earn a quick buck. But over the course of the film, something strange happens. As Dewey continues to teach his, his students, this man who has zero qualification to teach begins to unlock the real and actual potential within these students of his, helping them to overcome their insecurities, encouraging them to not just become better musicians, but to even begin to believe in themselves in that awkward phase that is the preteens, helping them to become better people. After a quick kidnapping plot, wherein Dewey takes an unapproved field trip for the students to go and play in the Battle of the Bands, and as their parents chase them down to try to rescue them, they all see their kids playing on the stage and realize what true talent they have. And before we know it, at the end of the film, Dewey, who was once a washed-up musician, is leading his own very successful music school as he finds his true calling in teaching. It's ridiculous, it's silly, but it's heartwarming to watch this man who has no business being a teacher come to grow into the role that he is posing as while his students grow into better people because of him. Through their relationship, the children become better musicians and better people, and through their relationship, Dewey transforms from a washed-up musician man-child to an incredibly successful, responsible teacher who cares about his students. Teaching is a fascinating thing. Chances are most of us know a person that is like Dewey, this person who is just a natural-born teacher. It is their calling in life, whether they do it for a career or not. It's that person who has random facts about everything and can break everything down into five easy steps. It's that person who you're walking in the park with and points to the anthill and says, you know, they can carry a thousand times their weight. I don't know if it's actually a thousand times their weight. I'm not that qualified as a teacher. And they explain to you everything about ants. And before you know it, you never cared about ants before. And now because of their passion, you're deeply passionate about ant colonies and you know everything about them. Chances are we all know that person. And I don't know about the rest of you, but for me, Oftentimes, it's because of those people, those natural-born teachers, that I personally feel even more insecure about teaching myself. Right? I stand up here, and I do this every single week, and I like to think I'm pretty good at it. Maybe I'm completely off base. But none of that comes easily to me. Everything I do up here has been learned through trial and error. I've bashed my head a lot of times. I got some bumps and bruises along the way to prove it. And I'm finally at this point where I feel at least kind of confident in what I'm doing. But it certainly doesn't come easily. For a lot of us, when it comes to teaching, I think we face a lot of insecurity. It's one of those costs that we discussed a few weeks ago. There's this fear, what if I don't know enough? What if I don't have all of the answers? What 
What if I'm just not good enough to do it? And because it's not something we feel confident in, it's something that we tend to avoid. And so when we reach Christ's words in the Great Commission, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, chances are for a lot of us, that's the phrase in that passage that makes our hands shake and our knees quiver. Because a lot of us don't feel qualified to teach. And because we don't feel qualified to teach, we feel insecure about it. And because we feel insecure about it, we have this tendency to avoid that which is our calling in life. And with that, if you have your Bibles with, would you please turn with me to Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Again, that is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So for the last few weeks, we've been going through this series, Go. And by looking at the Great Commission, Jesus' famous last words to his disciples, we've been learning what it means for us to be sent on mission and what it looks like for us to go. And throughout this series, we're going through all of these different phrases, ideas, and themes that are present in this same passage. So week one, we learned that for the message to be sent, a cost must be spent. And that if we're not willing to face these costs of insecurity, we place that on the people who need to hear. They have to face that risk of asking and vulnerability and things like that. They're in creating a barrier to the gospel. And so as the ones carrying the message, we should be the ones paying that cost. Week two, we learned the difference between go and as we are going in our evangelism with this idea that go is this go and do. You have a big event, you share the gospel at the end of it. And as you are going is to live and to be. We live out, we preach the gospel by our actions in our places of work, among our families, and let conversations start from there. And it truly takes both of these. And then last week we discussed baptism and the idea that baptism is a sign and seal of the covenant. Of the covenant. It is a symbol. And so in baptism, when we are plunged into the waters, we are literally buried with Christ. And when we are pulled forth, we rise with him as a new creation. And so through our baptism, we not only proclaim the fullness of the gospel, but we also sign on to the covenant ourselves. And so we gave the challenge last week, and I would encourage you, if you've never been baptized before, and that's something you're interested in, you can sign up in the lobby. And this week, we're going to look at what it means, what it looks like for us to teach. We find this in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which reads, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. So, up to this point in our series, here's where we are. We have paid the cost. We've met people on their turf. We've begun to live among people who don't believe the same things as us. We even bring people to this point of baptism. But from this passage, we learn that discipleship is a process that begins with baptism, not ends there. There's something that comes next. There's two parts to this discipleship. The passage tells us we make ba disciples by baptizing them, part one, and part two, teaching them to obey all that he has commanded. And there we have that insecurity again, to teach. But here's where it's important to note emphasis, to note the emphasis that Jesus has in this passage. Jesus' command wasn't simply to teach all that he has commanded, but rather to teach people to obey all that he has commanded. Do you see the significance of that shift there? To teach all that he has commanded is to know all of the answers. To teach to obey is to help people to surrender to Jesus in their daily lives. To 
teach them all that he has commanded is to help people to know it. To teach people to obey is to empower them to live it. One of these requires a whole lot of head knowledge. The other simply asks for a certain kind of lifestyle. Can I tell you all about my friend Daniel? Can I do that? No. Okay. Oh, wow. Y'all really responded that time. It wasn't just a nod. Like literally every person wasn't. Yeah, I was, sure. Yeah. Do it, man. Okay. Daniel knew everything about sports. And I mean everything. This kid was a walking ESPN encyclopedia. You name a sport, he could tell you his favorite player, his favorite team. He could tell you the stat lines, the win-loss ratios. He could tell you why people made formations that they did. He could tell you why that golfer in 1987 choked up on the club so uniquely. He could tell you about the obscure things, right? He'd tell you about, about cricket or rugby, the things that we don't actually watch here in America. Daniel was assigned as my roommate my first year of college. And before move-in day, before I'd ever actually met him, this kid would literally text me on a daily basis to tell me all about the game that happened last night or the game that he was looking forward to today, to tell me about the win-loss ratio of the Badgers because he knew I was from Wisconsin, even though I don't actually care about the NCAA that much. This kid knew everything. And for as much as this kid talked about sports, when I was picturing him in my mind, I was picturing like the peak physical athlete. I had Josh Allen in my head when I pictured Daniel. And so I was shocked when move-in day finally came and I met my roommate who was actually 5'6 and about 120 pounds soaking wet. Daniel was so knowledgeable that what I was expecting was an athlete. When in reality, Daniel wasn't somebody who lived and breathed to play sports. He was somebody who was wired in such a way that he truly just loved analyzing them. He knows everything about sports, everything. But Daniel was not an athlete. Thankfully, that was never his goal. And Daniel's actually made a great career for himself as a sportscaster, putting all of that knowledge to good use. Daniel knew everything about sports. But knowing everything about sports does not make an athlete. Playing the sport does. Anybody can know all of the commands of Scripture. But that doesn't make a person a Christian or a disciple. I have multiple friends who are professing atheists who could probably quote Jesus better than I can with all of my years of schooling. But knowing everything that Jesus said does not make a disciple of Jesus Christ. Disciples don't just know it. They live it. They obey. This great commission isn't for every one of us to teach a theology class where we walk people through all of the nuances of scripture, diving into the original Greek language. Our goal is not to give people all of the head knowledge in the world but to speak into people's heart knowledge that translates to the work of their hands. Not to know everything perfectly, but to learn to live in perfect submission together. More often than not, I think for most of us, one of our greatest struggles with discipleship and obedience has less to do with lack of knowledge and more to do with frustration or discouragement. It's not that I don't know. It's that I'm embarrassed that I'm not doing well because I don't know. It's not that I'm completely ignorant. It's that I'm ashamed that I can't do better. It's not that I can't succeed. It's that I'm afraid of what happens when I fail. It's often frustration and fear that stops us in our discipleship. But man, it's amazing what a little bit of encouragement can do. The final score of the game was 103 to 11. No lie, no exaggeration, the single most crushing defeat of my life, 103 to 11. 
Riley, my best friend in the world, never liked to play video games. He really knew nothing about them, but Riley loved NBA basketball. And the only way that I knew I could convince Riley to play a video game with me was to buy the latest NBA video game. But here's the thing. In that season of life, I loved video games. But in that season of life, I knew nothing about basketball. It's amazing how much things change, isn't it? I'm standing up here in my Bucks jersey right now. Aren't you, aren't you all proud of me? I'm growing as a person. Before I knew it, I was sitting down on a couch with Riley down by 93 points at the buzzer. And man, for as much as I loved to play video games, for as much as I wanted to play that video game with Riley, in that moment, I hated that game. I wasn't any good at it. I didn't understand what I was doing, and that was frustrating. I was using literally the best team in the game, and he was using literally the worst. And so I couldn't understand why I couldn't score at all, and Riley could score at will. I didn't get why my defenders were useless all the while Riley's blocking every one of my shots, each time yelling out, SWAT team, as he's swatting the ball out of my hands. Do you know how obnoxious that is? SWAT team! Every time I hear somebody say that, I curl up into the fetal position and cry myself to sleep. It was so bad. In that moment, I didn't just hate that video game. I hated the NBA. I hated basketball for making a fool out of me. I hated this stupid sport that I didn't understand, that I was so bad at I couldn't even score in a video game, much less real life. So, trying to die with dignity. I cracked a few jokes. I laughed it off and pretended that I was okay while I was fuming inside. When the game ended, Riley asked me for a rematch. Who beats somebody by 93 points and asks for a rematch? Isn't that awful? Like, that's the meanest possible thing somebody could do. And I'm trying to pretend that I'm not upset, so I reluctantly played another round. But this time, this time, things went differently. This time, I only lost by 85 points. <laughs> but something else happened in this next game. Now that Riley had played one game with me, he could understand how little I knew. And this time, as he was scoring like crazy, and I wasn't, he started to explain to me how he was doing it and why I wasn't. All right, man, he said to me, you see what I did there? I passed the ball over and over until I got you confused and you blew your coverage. And at the point that you blew your coverage, I gave it to my guy at the three-point line, and it's a whole lot easier to make a shot when there's no pressure. When you're playing, you just keep giving it to your best shooter and taking the shot no matter how many people are on him. Next time, worry less about who has the ball and worry a bit more about who's open. Wouldn't you know it, in the next couple of minutes, I scored my first three-pointer in the game. The next time he swatted the ball out of my hands and yelled, SWAT team, he said to me, okay, man, so everything that I said about three-point shots, completely forget that. You need to pay attention who has the ball under the rim. If you keep shooting with that guy who's 5'10", I'm going to swat it out of his hands every time because I've got a guy who's 6'10", right in front of him. Instead, put your tall guy under the hoop and pass it to him, or drive with your taller, faster guy. I started scoring a little bit more. As we were playing, he started to explain to me every player on my team, what they were good at, what they were bad at, why I should be keeping my sharpshooters at the three-point line rather than driving them into the paint, why I should be keeping the tall guy under the rim, why I probably should never give it to Ray Allen because he should have retired at that point and he couldn't dunk because his knees were about to break. Before I knew it, I'd lost again, but for as badly as I lost, I'd learned something, and I, I was excited, and, and I played the game better. So much so that as soon as we were done, this time I was asking for the rematch. 
And from that point forward, every single time we sat on the couch together, all that I wanted to do was play the game. And the next game I did a little bit better and the next game a little better. The more and more Riley sat with me and played the game, the more and more I understood it and the better and better I got. And the better and better I got, the more and more I loved the game. And the more and more I loved the game, the more and more I, I actually started to love the sport. Before I knew it, I was the one winning more often than not. This is seriously the dumbest thing in the world, but it was playing a video game on a couch with my buddy Riley that taught me how much I loved basketball. It's the reason that my office is filled with Milwaukee Bucks memorabilia. It's the reason I'm wearing a jersey right now. It's the reason my dog Bango is named after their mascot. To teach people to obey, I think, is less about sitting them down in the classroom and more about sitting next to them on the couch and playing the game with them. Encouraging people when they fall, giving them the courage to stick with it, to get back up, and to be excited about the opportunity to grow rather than ashamed by their failure. When I sit on the couch with you and I see your game, I can help you to identify and how to improve your shot. When we live our lives with one another, as we get to know one another, we can help people step into the fullness of what Jesus has for us because we're playing that game together and we understand each other and him. In School of Rock, the moments when Dewey shines as a teacher aren't when he's teaching a kid to play the bass. It's when a little boy tells him he's not cool enough to be in the band. And Dewey starts explaining to him what a gifted musician he is and how that's what makes him cool. It's not when he's writing a song. It's when the little girl who isn't brave enough to sing asks him for some courage and he tells her how wonderful she is. It's when the little boy who's afraid of his father and all of his expectations comes up to him with a guitar and he teaches the kid to loosen up and learn to love what he's doing rather than live in fear of people. When we're teaching people from the couch, we're teaching them how to obey. And when we're teaching people from the couch, we don't have to have all of the answers to every theological question. The only thing that this asks of us is that we get to know Jesus more and we get to know the person more and we continually point each other towards him. We're literally just lending each other the courage to face this in the moments when we're frustrated. And once you know it, the more and more we grow, the more and more we learn to love what we do. The more and more we play the sport together, the more and more we live the sport, the more and more our lives begin to revolve around the sport. My office is a shrine to the Milwaukee Bucks. I do not worship them, but they are my greatest passion next to Jesus, and I guess my wife. <laughs> oh, man. But let me tell you all. The Bucks, for the first time in 50 years, won the title this year right before we got married. It was like, right, good things happen in threes. My Bucks won. I got to marry that lady. And then I got to move here. And I'm not going to say the Bucks are in first place, but it's pretty close with everything. When we teach people to obey, when we sit on the couch with them, we learn to understand the game. And the more we understand it, the more we love it. And the more we love it, the more our lives revolve around it. So as the worship team comes forward, and as we move into a time of response. I've been thinking a lot about this sermon. How do we respond to this? And the thing that's just been in my head, right? I'm talking about if we're on the couch together, we're encouraging each other. We're helping to point each other to Jesus in those moments when we're frustrated. And for a lot of us, this idea of teaching is frustrating. So for our response time, Honestly, what I just want to do is take a moment to speak encouragement over each of you. If you don't feel qualified, <laughs> look at every person in Scripture. Moses stuttered, right? Noah got wasted. People did silly, foolish things. 
But God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. God knows you by name. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He has adopted you. He loves you. He adores you. He sent his son to die for you. In those moments when you might feel afraid, when you might not feel like you are good enough, he has proclaimed your worth by sending his son on your behalf. In those moments when you might not feel like you know enough, here's good news. Our all-powerful God's Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and he has promised to give us wisdom whenever we ask. We're never going to have every single answer. I don't have every single answer. But he does, and he is with you, and he is for you. And he is sitting on the couch with you, in the pew or the chair beside you. He's calling us to go sit with others. Let's join him. God, we praise you for who you are and what you are, for sending your to come and dwell among us, for walking with 12 people, doing life with them, teaching them to play the game, and that they so learn to love it that now 2,000 years later, we know it because of them. God, may we have that kind of legacy not for the sake of our name, but for the good of your glory, for the good of our community. God, when we are fearful, would you empower us to simply sit on the couch with you and each other? In Jesus' name, amen.